<laughs> Hello everyone and welcome back to the second part of this all six glitch the series. But this time we take on Silver's campaign to see where it's possible to beat his story without encountering any glitches. But before we begin, if you love Sonic content or challenge videos in general, and you want to see more content like this on the channel, do me a favour and smash the subscribe button, like the video and hit that naughty bell. Also, sharing the video helps out a ton and allows us to bring you more amazing content. Now just like the previous part, the same rules apply. This is a one shot challenge, meaning the moment we encounter a glitch of any kind, the run is over. So with that out of the way, let's jump straight in. Our adventure begins throughout this desolate future, as our new main character, Future Trunks the Hedgehog, briefs the audience into his struggles of combating the immortal flames of disaster. Don't get me wrong, whilst I find this premise interesting, if they weren't already scraping the bottom of the barrel when they ripped off both the Dragon Balls and Super Saiyan, we've certainly reached there now. Also, I'm not really sure if this place is trying to represent a destroyed Soliana, or if this is a different location altogether. Last time I checked, Soliana had incredibly modest terraced houses, not many of these skyscrapers outside of the new city at least. Anyway, Blaze shows up, yes, yeah, she's from the future now apparently, warning her student for the lack of a better word that the monster terrorising their era has appeared again, leading us to the first stage of the run, Crisis City. We are back here once again, but don't worry, this time there are no snowboarding sections, so we're pretty much safe, right? Now, Silver conceptually honestly seems like a badass. He can fly through the air at high speeds, has the ability to pick up objects and falls with his mind, and can pretty much do anything with his CBD powers. In execution though, yikes, I have no idea how they managed to fuck him up so badly. The most you're going to get out of his playstyle is for his range attacks. By pressing the right trigger, you can activate his psychokinesis to pick up random objects so you can fling them at the enemies. He can also levitate in the air for a small period of time, which has some real nice tech behind it. If you press the jump button in rhythm, you can extend his reach with this by quite a decent extent. That's where all the positives end, however. Silver, like everyone else, can't jump into enemies, nor can he pick them up without stunning them with his pimp slap first. A slap that has such pitiful range that you have to be standing millimetres away from the enemies, more often than not taking damage as a result. This wouldn't be as bad if Silver had some form of melee option to approach enemies like the homing attack, but no. All of his attacks are tied to the energy bar, so there are going to be times in the stage where you literally have to stand still and allow the gaze to recharge before you can do anything. It's so baffling to me that a character with this much potential in terms of an interesting gameplay style is restricted so heavily to the point of tedium. These stages are quite honestly a lot more fun if you simply run past everything, only fending off the enemies when you have to unlock a cage. So that's exactly what we did. Throughout some of the stages, there is this green pattern along the ground, and if you use Silver's powers here, you can actually summon the breed to use as makeshift platforms to reach other areas. It's a cool idea, but it never goes any further beyond pressing the button and waiting a few seconds. Regardless, after we hit a dash pad, we're sent to the next section of Crisis City, taking control of everybody's favourite fire kit here, Blaze. If you recall from the previous episode, I went and said that I think Blaze, apart from Sonic, is probably the best character to play as in this game. That's not saying much granted, but she's awesome. While she doesn't retain the boost from Rush, she does have a plethora of other abilities that truly allows her to come into her own. Outside of generally being faster than Silver, Blaze has a double jump with a quite a fair bit of reach. On top of this, she is capable of using the homing attack by pressing the attack button midair, something I swear they took inspiration for with Unleash, where the air dash and the homing attack were placed on the same button. And if that wasn't enough, by holding the tab on for a period of time and then releasing it, Blaze will initiate a fire tornado that absolutely decimates anything it comes in contact with. Seriously, even with the health bars under consideration, it takes me a second for Blaze to even deal with the opposition. It just sucks that we can only play as her in like two stages, where she's by far the best character in the game. I feel like I've just spent all of that time gassing her up for no particular reason, as to be honest, nothing actually happened during her segment. I was having too much fun that I forgot we were even doing a challenge run until we regained control of Silver for the final section. Now, Silver's version of Crisis City actually shares the final section with Shadow, as we approach the flame tornado at the heart of the city. We have to avoid the debris thrown out way along with the many Iblis monsters. Like before, we just avoid all the optional combat encounters, using the support beam of the building to catapult ourselves to the final skyscraper. There's an invincibility you can grab here towards the left, which pretty much keeps you safe on the march to the goal ring. I just couldn't be asked to grab it though, and upon levitating over the side of the wall, we clear the first stage of the run. When you think about this on paper, Iblis is kind of a badass. He is this immortal fire deity that single-handedly brought the world down to its knees. This thing, without a chaos emerald, mind you, did more damage than even the likes of Perfect Chaos. But his boss fights honestly kinda suck ass. All six in general, when it comes to Silver at least, has this really guilty habit of wait and attack boss design. It can't be helped when Silver has no means of attacking anything directly, however I feel like it would have been better to approach these encounters as a counter striker, forcing us to actively dodge swift attacks in a manner where we'd always be on the move. 
Instead, we just have to wait until Iblis slowly moves towards us and attacks us. He can pick up the buildings and launch them at Silver, which will leave chunks of debris that we can use to attack the weak point. At certain intervals, he will unleash a flurry of meteors that also serve as ammo for Silver's psychic abilities. The problem is Silver's throw attack is automated. We can't manually aim where he'll throw the objects he has a hold of, outside of aiming Silver towards him, of course. And because of how small the weak point around Iblis' head is, you might find yourself throwing the debris into orbit, forcing us to wait until more objects spawn onto the foothold. These encounters become more tedious than anything else, due to how RNG-based they really are, with how absolutely arse Silver's aim can be at times. Temporarily subduing the flames for the time being, Silver and Blaze lament on their constant struggle, fearing their days of combating the world's destroyer will never end. As if on cue, the duo are introduced to an eerily familiar figure claiming to know a way in which they can truly destroy Iblis. And it's here where I want to address something that I hear every time this cutscene comes up, about how Silver's an idiot to be trusting a guy he's literally just met. I'm sorry, but that train of thought is just absolutely bollocks. Yes, to us with an outside perspective on the situation, of course Mephilis looks shady. He has no mouth for God's sake. In universe though, without knowing that important context, Silver lives in a world that has been destroyed for centuries before he was born. Everyone he talks to can't or won't give him any clear answers as to what the hell happened, only pointing to the flames. He's been fighting an unwinnable battle with Blaze for quite some time, and then a dude who not only claims that he is well aware of a way to save this world from his hellish future, actually has documented records on the events that led up to this via the database, and then proves his worth by actually sending them both back in time, even though Mephilis in the end was manipulating Silver and Blaze. In their perspective at this moment in time, Mephilis has proven himself in every regard to be someone they can trust. And why wouldn't they? What other leads do they have to go off? Yeah, you can argue that Silver could have talked to Sonic instead of trying to kill him, but that wouldn't prove anything either. Even if Sonic was in fact hey. the evilest trigger, Mephilis brought Silver you back okay? to a point in time where Sonic hasn't even done anything yet. With that rant aside, the Psycho Hedgehog finds himself in a lush forest filled with people, nature and a clear blue sky. Throwing to fight for the sake of his future, he embarks on his journey to find the evilest trigger, leading us to the second stage of the run, Tropical Forest. <laughs> Welcome my friends, to the worst level that we will ever have to go through in Silver's campaign. Yeah, even worse than that bloody ball puzzle. Being serious for a minute, this stage performance issues aside is rather sandboxy for the lack of a better term. We are placed towards the start of the map, and the challenge is in figuring out the route to the goal. There is no set path which makes it incredibly difficult at times to know exactly where you're going. If anything, this version of the stage is designed more like a treasure hunting stage from Adventure 2, which is ironic since it does become one in Shadow's campaign. If you want an easy time here, don't bother with the bottom path that has the turtle and the fruit that you gotta knock down. Use the swinging logs to reach the upper path and do your best to remain up there. Not only will this give you a better view of the stage overall, you can avoid most of the mech encounters with the levitation to escape the stage relatively quickly. That still doesn't save us from the abysmal frame rate though. I mean just look at it. Despite absolutely failing on the glowy fruit frying, we still had enough height to reach the spring and this gave us a clear shot to the goal ring. Unfortunately we are forced into a mandatory combat encounter so we can unlock the spring from the cage. We are in luck since the whole port all this range by the red containers that explode and deal big damage on contact. So just use those to get rid of the annoying laser mechs whilst taking out the big guy once he's vulnerable, and Tropical Forest is pretty easy, albeit frustrating because of the performance issues. Meanwhile in Wave Ocean, Blaze in pursuit of her potted student contemplates the facts they currently had on their situation. Thus she heads for Soliana's castle town in search of silver and her blue target. I'm not really going to cover this stage as it's pretty much Sonic's version of Wave Ocean, with the gold ring being located where Tails' portion of the stage begins. Because of the fact that Blaze is the best character in this game, this was virtually a freebie and nothing remotely interesting even happened. As I said during Crisis City, I was having so much fun for at this stage that I completely forgot the reason as to why I was even playing the game to begin with. Moving on. With the blanket of night falling upon the peaceful realm of Soliana, our hero actually encounters Sonic for the first time. The last are just standing there upon the capture of the princess. Before he has time to do anything though, the man is blindsided by none other than Amy Rose and her dreadful eyesight. Okay, to give Amy some credit here, this isn't as bad as mistaking Shadow for Sonic in broad daylight. She has the excuse of it being evening combined with her awful vision. Feeling guilty that she prevented Silver from finding his target and having no bloody clue that they were in fact after the same person, she offers Silver her help in finding who he was looking for and does the two explore the turn of Soliana for more intel. They later discover Sonic has been spotted heading for the desert, however we can't go there ourselves without a pass from Lord Regis. The old timer is standing guard at the gate that leads us to the forest area in quite a panic stay at that. Turns out that Eggman had sent an army of mechs to break through into the main city, so he promises Silver a pass to the desert if he can deal with them. This just makes me question why this country has no semblance of defence at all. The most we see from these people are the incompetent police force. Do they have no military grade weapons at all? 
What we have to do here is pretty much identical to every other combat mission. There's a set amount of waves that we need to get through and with the added weapons we can use and even redirecting the mechs or missiles, this doesn't take very long at all, allowing us to enter the fourth stage of the run, Dusty Desert. Now, Silver's version of the stage like Shadows takes place within the ruins of the palace rather than the desert itself. And I have to give them some credit, I like the unique ideas brought to the pool table even if the execution isn't the best. We begin in this locked room with the ancient looking pool table. I guess the agents had fuck all better to do than play a few games in their off time. Once we take out the mechs, the stone pool balls are unlocked from a previously locked door, each with the number 9 on them, indicating how many shots you have left before they explode and you have to start over. At first you may think that this will be no problem, with you having 9 shots on each ball. However, that's a mistake. You only have 9 shots to put all 9 balls, sometimes even less due to how the countdown works. Each time Silver uses the pimp slot, this will lower the timer down by one, right? So a common strategy is to just let the balls roll to the back of the table before lining up any of your shots. It shows that sometimes the timer will go down for no reason at all. I'm not entirely sure if it's dependent on how hard the balls collide into something, or if the timer also takes the time in between your shots into account. If you know exactly why this happens, feel free to leave a comment down below. We get through this on our first attempts barely with the ball reaching its zero count on the final shot. Let this be a sign of things to come. From here, we need to cross the room with the quicksand and I kinda messed this up. It's been years since I played through Silver's version of the stage and so I didn't realise you could knock down the statues to use as a makeshift bridge, which really helps you out here. There are also the containers which replenish our gauge, giving us even more distance with the levitate. Just be sure to stick to the platforms on the sides and we can open the locked door leading to the Amy section. If you hated Amy in Adventure, what can I say? She ain't doing much to change your mind here either. Even with her slower speed back then, at least she had something going for her with her versatility when it came to her acrobatics with a Pico Pico hammer. In 06 though, they got rid of all of that completely. For one, she's slower, her hammer has gone from its over-exaggerated size to a tiny whack-a-mole handle, meaning we have to get into the mech's personal space for it to be even effective. She can turn invisible, which is kinda cool on paper, until you realise that to activate it, you need to stand still whilst holding the X button for a few seconds, and in the meantime, leaving yourself completely open to the onslaught of the enemies. I guess it can be useful to sneak up on a group of mechs, but the moment it runs out, you're forced to stand still to recover, which makes it more of a danger to use in crowded spaces. To top off this clusterfuck of misery, like Blaze, Amy also has her own double jump, only it doesn't really work. So when Blaze double jumps, whilst it gives her a boost to her vertical height, it also has enough forward momentum to actually make it useful. Amy on the other hand is the complete opposite. All of her momentum goes into her verticality, meaning that we'll be sent flying into the air only to drop like a rock quite literally where she started. Literally the only time you're going to get any use out of this at all, is in this scenario that you've undershot your jump marginally enough to need that wee bit of a push. At any other time though, you're most likely dying if you seriously try to use her pitfall jump. Granted her section is short enough to not cause too much of a hassle I guess. Most of the enemies are single mechs so getting close to them doesn't really impede us too often. If anything I had more trouble with the basic platforming because of her sensitive controls. Once we regain control of Silver though we're locked in a room with a mandatory encounter. The door to the infamous ball puzzle opens up upon defeating all of the mechs. Sadly for us we'll never get to experience this in this video because of what just happened. So I took out most of the mechs right with only one of the Bakugan like things left. The thing got its collision stuck against the raised lip of the floor and I wasn't sure whether this was actually a glitch or just a faulty collision to blame. So I just waited, and I waited, and I waited. As time went on, the result just became more hilarious, from merely being stuck on a random chunk of collision to having full on fucking seizures. In the end, the poor thing gave up and just despawned out of existence opening the door. <laughs> this game is so broken, I'm, I'm so done with this. I am done with this. Guys, I swear I'm not intentionally trying to break this game, it just keeps happening. Overall, my prediction was completely wrong. Even with a slower character, O6 finds a way to just sabotage itself and the run. I'm a bit disappointed that we couldn't even manage to get to the first rival fight this time, or even the ball puzzle. So here's hoping that episode Shadow gives us a little bit more luck when we tackle that in the next episode. As always, I just want to thank you all for your continuous support of the channel. We recently hit 1700 subscribers, and that wouldn't have been possible without you guys, so thank you. With that said though, I've taken up enough of your time. So take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye bye for now.